driving games. Love them or hate them, we've all played them at least once. But I have never seen one as utterly bizarre as Driver San Francisco. But it's bizarre in a good way because it's one of the most memorable games I have ever played. So today I'm going to 100% and find out exactly what makes this game stand out in a genre that rarely ever sees innovation. Driver San Francisco is a game developed by Ubisoft Reflections and released in 2011 for the Xbox 360, the PS3, PC, and the Wii. Kind of. The Wii version is a different game altogether and I'm not about to get into all of that. For a frame of reference for what video games were like at that time, this was the same year we got Arkham City, Portal 2, and of course, Duke Nukem Forever. Subscribe if you want to see me lose my mind playing that nightmare. When it comes to Driver San Francisco though, the first thing you have to understand is that it is not a racing game. In fact, it's barely even a driving game. This is a crashing game, and you have no idea how literally I mean that. And while there are many reasons this game is one of a kind, nothing makes it more unique than its core gameplay mechanic, shift. Shift isn't just your bread and butter, it's the whole goddamn sandwich. Driver San Francisco is an open world game taking place in, you guessed it, San Francisco. And shifting allows you to instantly replace the driver of any other car in the entire city. This is a feature that changes the entire dynamic of the game and frames it in a way that's nearly impossible to put into words. The ability does have some limitations though, mainly that you can't shift into the car of anyone classified as an enemy. But other than that, you have free reign to make every car in the entire city do anything you want while you leave your car on autopilot. This creates a completely unique gameplay approach that you'll probably never see in another game. One where instead of driving the fastest, you have to drive the smartest to win. Are you holding on to the lead? Then have someone block the path behind you, then shift back into your car to finish the race. Chasing someone that just got onto the highway? Luckily for you, there are countless maniacs ready to drive into them. I know this seems strange, but I highly doubt there is a way I can accurately show you just how satisfying this mechanic really is. Now that doesn't mean this game is without its faults. I do think this game is a hidden gem and you should play it if you ever get the chance, but it would be disingenuous of me to hold back my criticisms and I definitely have a few. My biggest nitpick is honestly the boost meter. The boost is trash. Early on in the game you have to do a tutorial once you unlock boost, showing you how to use it to get out of a chase. This is the only time it'll ever work. In every other chase throughout the entire game, including chases in free drive, enemies will automatically adjust to your speed while you're boosting. This makes it completely useless to get out of chases, and honestly makes it not matter for most of the game. Another complaint that I have is a pretty brief one, but it's kind of big. And unfortunately, it's that the driving isn't that great. I promise you this is still a game that's absolutely worth playing, but I would be lying if I said the controls were perfect. Every single car you can drive, from a Mustang to whatever this thing is, all control very loosely. And it led to me hearing the same exact question from all of my friends who saw me playing. Why does it look like you're using the handbrake? It definitely isn't the end of the world and it doesn't ruin the game or anything, it just takes a little getting used to. Besides that and a few other small problems, this game is honestly an amazing experience. Not just because of the insanely unique gameplay, but also because it's backed by an equally as unique story. The game starts off with the villain, a man named Jericho. He's making a deal with his fellow inmate in prison, and this is Rufus, and he is incredibly unimportant. You see, Jericho is planning to escape during his prison transport later that day, and Rufus is paying him to come back and free him at some point in the near future. Enter the protagonist, Tanner, and his partner Jones two police officers who are already on high alert and ready to closely monitor Jericho's prison transport. When suddenly this happens, Chopper, as the convoy I don't really get down, it that much. Police have cordoned off the route between the prison and the courthouse. Live travel updates every five minutes on <laughs> SF News. <laughs> Just keep us right where we are. Why? How? Where was that? During the confusion, Jericho takes the opportunity to strategically noclip to the front of his armored transport vehicle. Just because I like the story doesn't mean there aren't any plot holes. Then, without missing a beat, Jones and Tanner are on the scene, ready to hunt down Jericho. I don't believe this. After the game's first chase, you follow Jericho into an alley, only for him to somehow end up behind Tanner. It isn't long before he manages to push you into traffic, and then... Now the game really starts. This accident leads to the story's most interesting aspect. 
its framing device. Ooh. After the crash, we as the player now know for the rest of the game, Tanner is stuck in a coma and living in a dream world. But Tanner doesn't know that. Where any other game would probably hide this from the audience for a juicy third act twist, Driver San Francisco takes a different approach. This is how the game explains Tanner's sudden ability to shift into other cars, because none of the game is even real. You would expect that fact to make the game feel less tense, but it's actually the opposite. The storytelling throughout the game is usually loud and direct, telling Tanner exactly where to go and what to do, but beneath all of it, there's a subtle bit of direction going on, pushing the player to ask more important questions, like what do the events in Tanner's coma mean, and how important is the story we're seeing? All of this leaves you dripping with anticipation, waiting for Tanner to figure out what's going on. And the best example of this is in a series of missions helping out an amateur street racer named Jun Nakamura and his brother Ayumu. It's important to note that when Tanner uses shift, he's kind of just possessing people. As Tanner, we see him replace the driver of whichever car you picked. But from everyone else's perspective, the original person is still sitting there, except now they're acting like a crazy white guy in his 30s? This starts to come up more and more every single time you help June win a race, as this is one of the few series of missions requiring you to repeatedly possess the same person. It starts off being fairly innocent, with Ayumu being merely surprised by June's sudden ability to drive really, really well. So, it's like you're possessed. In a good way, right? But it very quickly devolves into really suspicious dialogue that makes sense to us, the audience, but only confuses Tanner. Thanks for helping us, it means a lot. What do you mean? You know who I am? I can recognize my own brother. Eventually it ends up being so blatant that it's creepy and almost seems threatening. Let's see the Victory! Good. Now plane tickets, go to college. By the way, give me my brother back. Find your own body. Fight your own battle. What did you just say? Things like this are putting pressure on Tanner constantly to make him feel like his world isn't real. Because it isn't all the while making us feel like there's more to it that even we don't understand, as if there's some sort of looming threat to this coma world that actually makes our impact here important. Despite having a pretty ridiculous amount of missions, there are surprisingly only a few that are central to Driver San Francisco's plot. It mainly focuses on our hunt for Jericho, which is largely playing out in real life just like it is in Tanner's dream. The first couple of missions involve Jericho's seemingly strange plan to steal large shipments of platinum and ammonia. But this, along with him kidnapping a chemist, brings us to a fairly startling conclusion. You could make hydrogen cyanide. Cyanide? Cyanide gas. Sarah, if you had 5,000 gallons of ammonia, how much gas would that make? I don't know. A lot. Enough to fill a football stadium, at least. After doing a few more side missions and spending a while trying to locate Jericho, you come to find out that he has the same exact shift ability as Tanner. <laughs> This information begins pushing Tanner closer to his limits as the entire case begins to make less and less sense. Then the game decides to just go off the rails completely. Jones? This level starts with time stopping, something that never really comes back up, and it has Tanner chasing an ambulance in a way similar to the multiplayer's trailblazer mode. Yes, this game has multiplayer and achievements for it. The meaning of this mission is mostly implied rather than outright told to you, but based off the dialogue that you get to hear from the back of the ambulance, it seems to be a flashback from Tanner's own ride to the hospital. What's happening to me? Damn it, Ricky. This guy's losing a lot of blood. Call for a police escort. I know that voice. This mission is also pretty quickly followed up with another one that not only changes the rules of the world that the game exists in, but changes up the rules of the actual game itself. After taking the place of a rookie climbing through the ranks of Jericho's gang, you come to find out that his newest objective is to assassinate Tanner. This leads to the game's most memorable chase scene where you control Tanner's car, but from the point of view of the guy attempting to assassinate him. This is not an easy experience to describe, but the phrase pleasantly awkward does come to mind. It's like he's leading us somewhere. Uh -oh. I'm no. Sure he's just panicking. Ah, oh, my brain. All of this culminates in Jericho shifting into Tanner's body, which is usually just on autopilot when he shifts. Tanner then has to jump into Jones's body in order to confront Jericho, who is still in his body. That's just about the best I can do at explaining the situation. It's pretty wild. What the hell's going on? This isn't the end of it, though. Continuing his attempts to capture Jericho eventually leads Tanner to his big third act twist, and the level design here is pretty intense. What the hell? Chasing Jericho leads us to all of the inhabitants of the city vanishing, effectively turning all of San Francisco into a liminal space. Driving through the game like this is pretty eerie. It's not outright horror or anything, but it makes you feel like something big is definitely coming. 
The game forces you to go in specific directions with a sort of Lost Woods effect locking you onto certain paths. Then, before you know it, you're back at the beginning. Oh god. I know this. This is what happened. I gotta change this somehow! I gotta! Jones, I'm sorry! What? Of South Beach, downtown, and the surrounding it turns out that Tanner was actually playing out the events of the daily news broadcast in his coma the entire time, meaning that the main events of this game were mostly real. Jericho really has stolen large shipments of platinum and ammonia, and the city is going into a panic at the threat of his pending attack. So, in response to learning this information, Tanner goes back into his coma. Despite knowing that this world isn't real, Tanner seems to be convinced that he has to resolve the conflict in his dream world, otherwise he won't be able to figure out a way to stop Jericho in real life. We then get an incredibly well executed cutscene that is destroyed by the compression on consoles. None of this is real. So what would be the point? Might feel good. Why don't we just kill each other? Right now. You son of a bitch! That's more like it! What are you gonna do though? Better do it quick! Smell of death in the air, Tanner! I'm gonna ask the questions now, asshole. Jericho's not a terrorist. It's not some vendetta or revenge plot. Then sounds like your game, Tanner. I mean, who's inside who's mind here, right? Yeah, it's not him. He's smarter than this. Thank you. Building a bomb. It isn't him. Having people think that there's a bomb is brilliant. Shit, I gotta wake up. All right, come on. Come on, John. Wake up. Oh, wake up. Wake up, god damn it! God damn it! Wake up! After the cutscene, we're treated to one last showdown with Dream World Jericho. And god damn is it good. Okay. I'm throwing some goddamn cars too! That's right, this driving game devolves into a car throwing boss fight against a nightmare man. Just let that sink in. What's more is that this is so fun, it's insane. Unfortunately though, it's also really easy to cheese. It did not take me long to find out that there's nothing stopping you from grabbing the cars that Jericho is throwing at you while they're still in midair. This pretty much makes the fight impossible to fail unless you're somehow even worse than me. Our reward for beating the boss fight? Tanner is released from his coma and we get one final chase in the real world. No shift, no useless boost, just you and the real Jericho. We're not done with the game yet though, because beating the campaign will only guarantee you 15 of Driver San Francisco's 50 achievements, and some of those remaining 34 achievements can be a real grind. I started playing this game all the way back in October under the threat of a pending shutdown of the game's multiplayer server, making it impossible to 100% it as well as other Ubisoft titles on the 360 like the Assassin's Creed games. But this server shutdown kind of just never happened, and you can still play the match made playlist as of me posting this video. I'm not sure why this didn't happen, but a few less games with unobtainable achievements is okay with me. That of course means that I rushed through the multiplayer achievements before I ever even touched the story. And trust me when I say, they are a huge pain. If this is a game you plan to ever complete to 100%, make sure you have a fun crew to boost with, otherwise you will not get anywhere. Seeing as how the servers are empty, you need at least one person to help you out getting games started, but a few achievements are walled off into playlists that require a minimum of four players total. So thank you to the boys in my Discord for helping me out even though I started the game way behind them. Of these 15 multiplayer achievements, absolutely none of them are hard and you should have all of them well before you get Master, which is the most time consuming one for hitting level 38. And trust me when I say, it is time consuming. So, this takes us back to the campaign with 20 unaccounted for achievements. 
The easiest ones left for us to get are hands down a series of seven achievements related to the garage mechanic. I got these while I was playing the story, but you can honestly get them whenever. You generate money in this game passively and you'll end up with more than enough to get everything without too much effort. Speaking of passive though, there are also two separate passive achievements for shifting a thousand times and driving 1000 miles. You will not have to try to get these at all. Seeing as how they count for the time spent in the multiplayer as well as the story, it's nearly impossible to not get these while doing the other achievements. Now, if you've ever achievement hunted before, then you probably know that some bad games have some really good achievements, and some good games have some pretty terrible ones. And unfortunately, Driver San Francisco falls into the latter category because of the dares and activities. The missions in Driver San Francisco are called activities, and while there is a decent variety, doing all 50 activities in the game will have you doing similar missions over and over again. As much as I like the game, this is an experience I can only describe as super grindy, and it only gets worse for the dares. These are like mini activities, and in total there are 80 of them. Some of them are cool, but a lot of them are just repeated an excessive amount of times. This and the activities added somewhere over 13 hours to my achievement hunt. Believe it or not, I actually did it all in one sitting after chugging a bunch of gamer subs, who had sent me some free product to try after seeing some of my videos. Unfortunately though, I'm out of it because my friends drank it all! But now I'm partnered with them, so if you ever want to support me, you can use discount code STRAYDOG for 10% off. You might need it too, because we still have 7 achievements left to go. Luckily though, these ones are the kind we love to see. Two of them are for collecting all of these tokens scattered throughout San Francisco. You actually can't see these tokens while you're zoomed out on the map in shift mode, so getting them is the only time in the game you're incentivized to just drive around. The last five are all sort of classic style achievements that are done by doing some sort of trick or challenge, so they require no investment but have a much wider range of difficulty. All of these are fairly original and pretty fun, except for one of them which pissed me the hell off. The first one I did was Blast from the Past, a really unique challenge that's framed as a callback to the tutorial from the first driver game. You unlock this by driving 88 miles per hour in a DeLorean and starting it puts you in a parking garage. Am I dumb? What? What is a slalom? This can be challenging to do in such a short amount of time, and it will take you a few attempts to figure out the most optimal order to go in. From here, I got an achievement for finishing 30 cop chases in free drive, which I mostly did playing as the cops. Playing as the robber does count, but with my earlier mentioned problem with boosting, it is much less time efficient and can be a little stressful. No! Oh my god, let me out! No! After that, we can get the achievement Lombard Streak, which is unlocked by driving down San Francisco's famous Lombard Street over 20 miles per hour without ever hitting anything. This shouldn't take more than a few tries and can even be unlocked as early as the second chapter, but it does seem a little buggy, so don't be mad if it doesn't pop on the first try. Finally, we have our penultimate achievement, and the hardest one in the game, Ramped Up. Now, believe it or not, I'm actually the type of person that enjoys getting mad at games. If something can infuriate me, then it's probably just boring. I'm of the mindset that it's healthy to get a little bit toxic sometimes, but this achievement pushed me well beyond my limit. To get it, you have to redo any of the getaway activities, but in a car transporter. I don't think I have to explain to you why this sucks. I lost my mind doing this achievement. You would assume the best strategy for this to be just destroying the cop cars, but no. They just respawn. Boosting is obviously useless, and to top it all off, you're timed. I lost my cool more than a few times. Is that enough time? Oh my god, I have just enough time. No! He's camping! Oh my god. But with some determination and patience, I played it until I got lucky after two hours. Once I finally got it though, I capped off Driver San Francisco with the final achievement, Show Off. While its achievements aren't for those limited on time or patience, if you ever see a copy of Driver San Francisco floating around, you need to play it at least for the campaign alone. Its achievements won't be possible forever though because its multiplayer will eventually go down. So if you're an achievement hunter, you better get started soon. Thank you to everyone who watched and a special thanks to my members like Nevermore, Mindless Actions, RyanMK666, Not A House, Banana Bread Sandwich, Tanner Moulton, and Colby Workman. 
Bye.